boy, I'd like to move some people. Get some people moving. Like my pastor always says, you can't steer a parked car. You could sit around and stew and say all day and all night, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I wish I knew what to do. God, would you tell me what to do? How many ways can you say that? And maybe you don't know what, you can, what to do, but maybe there are things that you can do. We'll do that. Now, if it's a sin or a crime, don't do it. You, you understand? <laughs> he told me to do something. No, it, it, there, there are things that you can do that are good, that are helpful, and, and, and you can do it. Maybe you haven't been willing to do it. Maybe you thought you were too developed to do it or too good to do it, but you can do it. And here's these four lepers and what they were about to do looked just as insignificant as a bottle of oil or five loaves and two fish or the jawbone of a donkey or a rod in someone's hand. They said, we can't do anything except we could go over there. Well, what's that going to do? Well, it'll hasten the end, <laughs> whatever that's going to We don't have to sit here and starve. And so they just began to move in that direction. And you know, this is one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. It's right up there with the Red Sea parting. They, four lepers, I mean, I'm sure they didn't march. <laughs> they were starving to death and they were lepers. They were diseased. They probably more like dragged themselves toward this huge army. And God made it sound like a big army that was charging toward them. He made it sound a thousand times louder than it was. Four lepers walking in the desert don't make much noise. You, know? <laughs> you might not even hear them come up on you if you were, you know. At... So God did something supernatural, but once again, he didn't do it without their help. Do what you can. God could have come down and said, you poor lepers, you're starving, everybody's starving. Just sit back here and watch me take care of this problem. You just don't see God doing that. He works with us in conjunction with us, even in the gifts of the Spirit. So many times the gifts of the Spirit come just as a whiff, a word, even the word of knowledge, it says a word of knowledge. Why? Because many times all you get is a word, just a word, and you give that word and then you get more or a word of wisdom, or a tongue, an interpretation. You get just a, 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 you get a fragment of it, and then you take that and he gives you more. It's a principle that God uses throughout his kingdom, and, and we, not, we ought not to, to let that principle go, especially when it concerns our future, our destiny, what we're gonna do with our lives. Use the principles that are tried and proven that have been shown over and over in scripture. Don't default and say, you know what? God loves me, I'm special, and I know he's gonna do something. Yeah, but he's not gonna break all the rules just for you. You're gonna have to stick your foot out there. You're gonna have to step in the water. You're gonna have to sow a seed. You're gonna have to do something to get this thing moving because God works with us, not apart from us. I've seen too many people who've put their life on hold waiting for God to do everything else or do the next thing and nothing happens. Whereas if you'll go out and do something, get involved, do something even if it looks as menial as stuffing envelopes, God can use that to promote you. Does that make sense? And, and I, I can't say this any clear, but, 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 I, but it is a burden. I've got a series called Answering the Call, and we deal with this quite, quite a, a bit because it, it's a burden to me. I'm from Tulsa. We have so many Bible schools in Tulsa. Therefore, we have a lot of Bible school graduates in Tulsa, and some of them have been there for decades, and they've never done anything. Not that they were supposed to be a preacher or start a church, but they could have done something. They could have gotten involved, and I feel like they are disappointed, and I feel like they feel like they could have done more, but they didn't, and that ought not happen. But now that this Bible school and others are here in this area, you have the same effect here. And th that shouldn't be the case. And it burdens me that people are under false ideas and false impressions and they're doing nothing because they think that they're supposed to wait and that God's going to do something next. But a friend of mine said, God's the fastest chess player in the world. It's always your move. <laughs> and then you move and he goes, your move. I just moved. Yeah, but it's still your move. 
So you, you move and it seems like God's not moving, but you take the step and you make the move and get the thing going and then the Lord can direct it and he can multiply it and he can bless it. He just doesn't do these things for show and he doesn't do them I mean, I can't think of a place where he did it without somebody's cooperation. Even the poor man sitting by the pool of Bethesda who couldn't walk. If God was just going to do everything for somebody, it ought to be that poor guy. He'd certainly paid the price being that way 38 years and being by that pool so long. God ought to just come down and say, look, you have suffered long enough. I'm going to just take care of this and I'm going to heal you, make you whole, take you home, put you in bed, tuck you in and give you a warm milk. But that's not what God did. God said, rise, take up your bed and walk. You may be an invalid, but we're going to do this together. Isn't that a good principle? Are you getting this? Some people are in a rut today because they're waiting for God to do something and he's waiting for them to do something. And my question is, why sit we here till we die? I use this, my, I'm, I'm practicing my own preaching right now. I, I felt like God was telling me that and, and, and I began to get involved in social media and then the internet TV thing and we've only scratched the surface, but it all started with me starting. I had to take a step and do something I wasn't comfortable with. I didn't want to get on Facebook. Do you like me? Like me on Facebook. Um, but you understand it was all, but, but it was a step and it wasn't a big step and it wasn't a gigantic step and it wasn't an earth shaking step, but it started. And I began to do the Facebook thing and I hired somebody to help me and we started putting pictures together. And it wasn't about four months of doing that. We didn't even get it launched. And Andrew called and Andrew said, I'm starting an internet TV channel and I want to offer you free program, free time, free air time. I said, I'll take it. I said, we were just going to try to do a social media thing and didn't know what we were doing, but this will work perfectly in what we're trying to do. And it does. It's become the content stream. And now we do those clips. We do shows, clips, posts, and it all revolves around that program. And we're all over Facebook now. But before we did nothing, we had nothing. I could have waited. Who's the founder of Facebook? What's his name? Mark Zuckerberg. I could have sat in my room and said, God, you're almighty. If you want me on Facebook, have Mark Zuckerberg call me and invite me on Facebook so I can get the gospel out. You know, I'd still be waiting. The truth is Mark probably doesn't want me on there, but, but whatever. <laughs> we probably don't agree theologically, but that's another sermon. But do you understand what I mean? You, you could sit back and do nothing and nothing will happen. But why sit we here till we die? Have you ever seen a child learn how to walk? What do we do with them? Do we sit them in a corner and say, here, here's your foo-foo and here's your blankie. Now you just sit there, Junior, and watch Daddy walk. Here's what you do. You take your foot and you put it in front and you do your arms and you stay upright and it's, it's a beautiful thing. You see, I got from here to there. Want to see it again? I'm going to do it again. I make it look easy, don't I? Now, you're too little to walk. You just stay there and watch. You don't do that to teach a kid to walk, do you? No. Now, if a kid had the mentality that some of us do, they'd say, I can't walk. <laughs> My muscles aren't developed. I don't have the skills. I just, I'm not ready. I'm six months old. I don't need all that pressure. <laughs> just going to stay here in the stroller. carrier. I'd like some more milk, please. Now. What do you do with them? Hey, Junior, you're going to learn to walk. Now, come on. Stand up. And he's going, this ain't going to end well. I'm not going to make it. I can't walk. I'm a baby. I don't walk. That's something I don't do. I'm not formed. I don't do. Come on, take a step. Try it. Get out there. Take that step, boy. Come on, do it. And then they, you ever seen them? 
They take a step, fall flat on their face. But if you're a good parent, you're there. Amen. You're there. You know they're not going to walk across the room. You know they're only going to take one step, but they got to take that step or they'll never walk. They've got to take, the, you can't take it for them. They can't sit and watch you walk for the rest of their life. They'll never learn how to walk that way. We do this all the time. This same principle is used over and over and over in life. And then when it comes to us, we're like, God, you better do it because I just can't. I, you know, if I try this, I'm going to fall flat on my face. And God says, I know that, but I'll catch you. Amen. We're never going to get where we're going if you don't take that step. And if you don't, because the first time is not so good. And then the next time there's two steps and then they fall. And then there's three. And before you know it, they're walking, but they, they didn't do it uh, with all you and none of them. That's not how life works. Amen. Amen. Driving is the same thing. Personally, I think 16 is way too young to turn a youngster loose in an automobile, but that's the way it is. And you, but you get them out and you don't just teach them in a laboratory. You don't teach them to drive by you doing all the driving. At some point, you got to put them in that car and everybody get out of the way. <laughs> Student driver. Man, they don't have to tell me twice. I pull over. I'm... You got to do it. You got to get in there and you got to try it. And of course, they're going to have accidents and you're going to back over the curb. You're going to make all those same mistakes that we all made, but you can't do it if you don't begin. You can't, you got to, you got to start. You got to do what you can. Has it ever seemed as if you couldn't get ahead in life? Stop waiting to be rescued. The key to your miracle is always within your reach. Order your copy of this series, Get Out of the Rut at gregfritz.org.